uh, hasten the, and uh, speed up the recycling of uh, uh, nutrient cycles, which allows for uh, a greater abundance of these more advanced life forms. Without these um, uh, plants, uh, these um, uh, vascular plants, it simply wouldn't be possible to have birds and mammals upon the planet. So you need to have these plants in abundance for quite a period of time before the solish animals came Well, they need the to scene. be in effect in order to have the nutrients recycled throughout the environment uh, at a sufficiently efficient rate. And also, it's these plants that, uh, that provide the profusion of food uh, uh, that okay. these uh, advanced animals require. Food supply. All right, how then does the origin of solish animals, and you'll explain what that means, put to the test competing creation and evolution models? Well, what I've noticed in the naturalistic camp and the theistic evolutionary camp, too, is they really don't pay attention to the challenge of solish life. If you go back to Genesis 1, God creates three different kinds of life. Life that's purely physical, life that's physical and soulish, and then human beings that are uh, body, soul, and spirit. And when the Bible speaks about soulish life, it's referring to these creatures that are endowed by God with mind, will, and emotions so that they can form relationships, personal relationships with members of their own species where they can nurture and care for one another, uh, but they can also do the same thing for the human species. And it's one thing to talk about putting together a whole bunch of molecules uh, to make a bacterial uh, cell, for example. It's quite another to say, where did this soulish feature come from? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a physical feature. And so uh, that's something that the evolutionary camp has simply never been challenged with to explain uh, where these soulish characteristics came from. Uh, there really is no physical explanation for it. And then the second challenge is, God designed these creatures to serve and please human beings long before human beings even existed. And again, from a naturalistic perspective, uh, why would natural mechanisms like uh, you know the Darwinian mechanisms of natural selection mutations uh, produce features for which there is no need? Hmm. Uh, you know, not until human beings show up on the scene is this need even going to exist. All right, Hugh, let's get practical <clears throat> here. We all have pets. Everybody loves pets. They have dogs, cats, birds, what have you. These are, the, these are what you're talking about as soulish animals, right? Right, and the interesting thing about those creatures is they, they have powerful motivations to serve and please one another and nurture one another. I'm talking about within their own species. Uh, but secondarily, they're designed to do the same thing to human beings. Hmm. And so they're actually nurturing and uh, caring for and uh, serving and pleasing uh, creatures that are not even members of their own species. So are you saying that these creatures are endowed with these characteristics, per perhaps even over-endowed, if you look at it from a naturalistic perspective, but if a creator has these creatures in mind to serve humanity, it would make sense to have this soulish feature? It also would, too, if uh, God is endowing and uh, uh, holding the human species responsible to manage the resources of the whole planet for the benefit of all life. So it's a two-way street. Uh, from God's perspective, these creatures uh, stand to benefit significantly from having these relationships with human beings. Likewise, we do, because these are the creatures that really sustain our agricultural activity. And as you pointed out, they're the creatures that really entertain us. So we right. bring them into our homes as pets. And, you know, who doesn't have children that are very much uh, pleased and entertained uh, by these birds and mammals that uh, we uh, tame and uh, uh, and we can see how how powerfully motivated they are to both serve and, and to please us. But interestingly, they do it in very different ways. Again, the evolutionists, going back to their models, would, would say, for example, well, the horse and the donkey and the zebra have a common ancestor. That explains why their physical features are so similar. Indeed, you can take the horse, the donkey, and the zebra, and uh, you can force them to breed with one another. Now, the offspring are not reproducible. Uh, but um, they, you, you can do that because of how physically close they are. But if you look at their soulish features, the way that they're uh, programmed or designed to serve and please human beings, they're radically different from one another. Mm. You know, the way a horse relates to us is very different from the way the donkey relates to us. Uh, you don't climb on a donkey and ride a donkey into battle. That's not going to work. Mm. Uh, but a horse will do that for you. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the advantage of a donkey is that uh, it can switch from being feral to being tame um, effortlessly. A horse can't do that, but a donkey can. 
and that really has advantages in terms of sustaining our agricultural activity. So you really do want to have both donkeys and uh, horses uh, if you're uh, trying to husband uh, uh, these creatures. So it's a diversity of these soulish animals that has allowed for human civilization to develop the way we have today. Right, and the fact of the matter is that here's the horse and the donkey that are physically very close to one another, but in terms of their soulish features, they're poles apart. And so the idea that they evolved naturally from a common ancestor uh, in some respects might have some rationality from a physical perspective as none from a soulish perspective. Mm, yeah, I, I see what you're getting at now because they, they do express themselves differently. Anybody who's been around these animals, you can recognize that. Right. And like, you know, the next book I'm working on is Answers in Job, and in one sense this chapter serves as a preview for what I'm going to develop there, where it makes the point that uh, these creatures all played critical roles in launching human civilization. So like the donkey and the horse both played a critical role in uh, getting human civilization going, but in a very different way. All right, Hugh, just to try to rescue the naturalistic perspective here a little bit, could they not say uh, that these animals, just because of their contact with human beings, uh, develop these uh, soulish characteristics? They wouldn't use the term, but perhaps want mind, will, and emotions, just so they, in turn, could survive with humanity on the scene? Well, that would make sense if we showed up before they did, but the truth of the matter is they were here millions of years, some of them, before we came upon the scene. With these characteristics? They were pre-programmed in advance to serve and please us. Hmm. And so from an evolutionary perspective, there's no driving mechanism to explain why these creatures would have these features and be programmed in this way before we even existed. Yeah, so the fact that they predated is problematic. Right. All right. Well, fascinating stuff. So people can uh, learn about uh, these features in Chapter 11 of More Than a Theory. How about the next chapter, Hugh? What we're going to do the next chapter is look at the most advanced species of all, namely human beings. We're the most advanced? (laughs) Well, we're body, soul, and spirit. The (laughs) birds and mammals are much more advanced than other animals in that they have a soulish characteristic in addition to the physical, but we human beings alone, according to the Bible. And, of course, that's a major issue of dispute between evolutionists and creationists. Uh, you know, are humans simply the product of natural descent uh, from animals, or are we really unique and uh, uh, specially created? One, because you're talking about uh, the origin of humanity. Well, we, we are, and uh, the origin of humanity is where the competing, the predominant competing models, like theistic evolution, naturalism, young earth creationism, the model we offer here at Reasons to Believe, all predict radically different things about what scientists should discover about human origin. So this is a powerful chapter for putting to the test these uh, competing models. All right, let's ask a question for the naturalistic model. What is the probability, if you can uh, calculate it, that a species as advanced as human beings would ever evolve from bacteria? Well, this is one of the new features of the book. I mean, you know, Fuzz and I have written this book, Who is Adam?, a whole book about human origins. And I'm trying to summarize what's in there, but also uh, talk about some new research that's happened since then. And we talk about here is how, from a naturalistic perspective, assuming that mutational advance operates as efficiently as the most optimistic Darwinists would ever imagine, likewise natural selection, gene exchange, and just concede all of their arguments for the efficiency at the rate at which naturalistic evolution could go, What is the probability that starting with, say, bacteria, you'd wind up with the equivalent of human beings? And a number of uh, researchers from an evolutionary perspective have pointed out the probability is incredibly tiny because these naturalistic evolutionary processes are much more likely to go in a simplistic direction than a more complex direction. 